Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Norm, you're back from CS, but you're going to be gone again next week. Yes. But we're bringing <laughs> back you to in. CES. Yeah. And, and Adam and I are going to be wearing the same clothes as last week I and will. next week, but, I will. but we changed this time. Um, I'm wearing my coat because it's freezing cold in the <laughs> cave right now. That was really smart. I, I Mine's sitting right over there. And I really <laughs> wish I'd, I'd gotten it before we started this because it's it's brisk. It's San Francisco cold, which is a whole different kind of cold. It is. It's a it's a it's a it's a wussy cold according to the rest of the world. But very, in San Francisco, yeah. we're very upset about these forty degree days. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's. 40 degrees here is worse than 20 everywhere else I've ever lived. Well, it's because you don't ever have the right clothes. And personally, my house, I'm not used to heating it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're all over the map. Like half the time I walk into the house, it feels like I'm in a greenhouse. Like it's way over sauna. Yeah. And the other half of the time, it's like so cold, I'm weeping. Well, you got to no use a nest. I'll, I'll yeah, put, I have it. a nest. Exactly. It's still. It's. It's just not. It's trying to get used to us. The oh. nest doesn't know my. It doesn't work with my heating system. I have that old a heating system. It uses this no. millivolt thing. You can't. You. You can just get the eight dollar one off the shelf at Lowe's. That's the. That's the most fancy thermostat I can no, get. No, I'm horrible. sorry. Yeah, no technology for me. Um, at this point, for once, we've all seen. Like, I'm usually the one that lags on this stuff. I've seen Django. You've seen Django. I've seen Django. Norm's Django. seen Django twice. Norm went Norm's back for Django. more. I even took my um, my new uh, Tarantino adepts, my thirteen year old twins, to see Django, which mm. I, I recognize is a questionable decision, but I, I will get to it later. Why I think it uh, was a good one. I don't think it's questionable. It's, it's intentional parenting choice. It, it is an intentional parenting yeah. choice. Yes. So it had like, one others might not agree with. When I was thirteen, there were no Tarantino movies yet, <laughs> right? Norm, you were you were young enough to grow up. Pulp uh, Fiction. Pulp Fiction was when you were 13 years old, right? It was probably when I was younger than that, but that was one of the first. Uh, I, I think I was exposed to uh, I should, Natural Born Killers was probably my first. Oh, like, yeah, okay. okay. Hard R like movie. Proto real yeah. violence yeah. In, yeah. in film. That's pretty rough. I never understood yeah. why they call it Pulp Fiction. And then it, it all makes sense now, of course. <laughs> yeah, tw 20 years later. Yeah. Um, so, I, so do we like Django? What's, I, what's the feeling around the table? I love Django. And just to give background, you read the script beforehand. I read the script about uh, about a year ago. Mm -hmm. You read you read the script beforehand? I didn't. I chose not to. I started it, okay. and I realized I would be ruining. I, I again, it was an intentional decision, right? Not you, to read it, but you read it between the two screens. But between, yes, ah, yes, mm. yes. So I, I thought it was quite good. Yeah, thoroughly enjoyed. Now I'm a when I'm a fan of somebody, I I'm a big fan, and Tarantino is. My favorite living filmmaker right now. There's a shelf back there with. with yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm afraid to touch this cable because it's gonna make a bad noise. <laughs> but we've got an airsoft version of uh, Vince's pistol there, yeah. or Jules's this is pistol. Jules's pistol. Yes, Mister um, Nine Millimeter here. I'm just gonna put it. It's not really nine millimeter, but well, we'll, we'll <laughs> yes. talk about that some other time, I guess. <laughs> yes. Um. So. Like Django was one of the most. Usually, Tarantino movies are uncomfortable in a, the in the mixture of violence and humor, and and it's it's kind of like that's the that's the thing that he does right. at this point. This was uncomfortable because it was at least for me. I was sitting in a theater full of people and kind of absorbing the movie. And I don't think we've talked about this yet, but but watching things and laughing and thinking, oh god, I can't believe I just laughed at that because I was one of two Tarantino people in the theater wants. laughing. Of he course. says he. The worst thing for him, he considers it a failure if he if he goes into a screen and people watch his movies and don't know they're supposed to be funny. Now, of course, there are certain scenes in his movies that it's very difficult to laugh at, but many things are funny. Well, and frequently at a time when there's something that's horrific or incredibly racist or racially charged or profoundly uncomfortable, he'll also put something funny in the background. Well, that's, I mean, that's one of the things that he does. He uses that fear and violence to make cut the comedy extra funny and he often gives you a laugh breath at the same time as he's giving you a <gasps> moment uh and it's it's actually it's a feeling look i know that i know that there are those out there who feel like that's a gimmick on his part that it's a almost like a a, a, a tick uh but stylistically i find i really enjoy that feeling as the movie goer and i think that the way he exploits I, in a way, I think of Django as a maturation of that form because what he's doing with that, to me, speaking as, a, you know, speaking as me, uh, is he's engendering a conversation in my head about the things that I find funny, the things that I find horrific, and the things that I find awful to look at. Yeah. You know, the, and th that's a really important conversation. For example. Well, 
I mean, almost all of the big laughs in the film come at the ex- come at the expense of some horrifying violence. Um, except, and we're going to be talking spoilers here. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so if you yeah. spoil it, full conversation. Let, yeah. Let's talk about that. We we didn't all go see this movie, so we could just talk about that. <laughs> high points. Skirt around the, the edges. The yeah. first big laugh, the first humongous laugh, is 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 Django's blue boy costume. The blue yes. boy costume, which is funny, because in the script. He actually does not choose his costume. He is very disgruntled. The costume, the blue boy costume, is chosen for him. Oh, so it's a, it's a, and it's part of the story that Christoph Waltz is telling uh, when they go on the first, on the yeah, first bounty. As opposed to in the movie, he goes, "Oh, I get to choose my costume." And then the, the joke is that it's a, this is the costume he would have chosen. It's and a, it, it's a beautiful. It's just. It's a, it, it makes you feel the character is so human. Oh yeah, right. Like like a like a ten year old kid. But yet at the ways. same time, larger than life because right. he's wearing this right. flamboyant costume. But right. but it, I mean, it, in the th- at least when I saw it in the theater, this was a laugh that was a huge huge laugh. Yes. that just boom closed in on itself. Like people were like laughing. <laughs> oh shit! I can't believe I'm laughing at this. <laughs> Pull back, and and everybody's kind of looking around, going, "Is this?" Are, we're bad people now, right? I mean, and he's got well, then that's certainly not that. Not the not the the, the worst one of those, I, but uh, you know, there's the entire comedy scene of the clan trying to figure out its first the, rally. The, <laughs> well, the hood, the hood, right, the, hood, the, problem the, the hooded hoods. clan, which, which is, is, you know, I love Tarantino for writing it and thinking. I wonder how hard it is to ride a horse wearing one of those hoods. It <laughs> seems like, almost like a, a side, like a non sequitur conversation. That, What's that the movie royale with cheese? It, but. The fact that it's slotted in there and still plays in the oh. middle of this intense scene is is very Tarantino. And I also, I, I tell you, I was really surprised, and I would not have believed you if you'd told me that Don Johnson has an incredible cameo in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, but he's in there because of Lonesome Dove stuff, right? I mean, it's a it's a it's a homage it's, it, to westerns. Yeah, it's and it's Don not Johnson Nash Bridges. Has a history with that, right? Right. Yeah. Well, Nash um, Bridges is some fine work. Don't don't talk smack about Nash Bridges, Chan. So I I have to say I'm 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 fascinated by the film. I'm fascinated by the conversation it engenders internally among the view uh, in the viewer about race mm-hmm. uh, and and America's history. Um, I am wary of I'm wary of talking about it from the position of a of a privileged white dude from you know. Frickin' White Plains, New York. Not really. I'm from Terrytown, but <laughs> White Plains is much funnier in this enough. context. Yeah, I'm thinking of that joke from Thirty Rock where he says, "I don't need some lady from Whiteville, t- white lady from Whiteville, telling me what I what I know." And she says, first of all, it wasn't Whiteville; it was called White Haven, and it wasn't that nice." So yeah, I, at the same time, I've been reading. Uh, I've been reading a ton about it, and I think that it is you know. It's funny because Metafilter, one of my favorite online communities, um, largely is very doesn't like Tarantino. I know that sentence wasn't That's properly structured. Metafilter, them not like Tarantino. Them, bad. them not like largely Tarantino. Largely critical of Tarantino. Quite critical, or maybe think that he's overrated. I, I maybe the, maybe the overrated is a, is yeah. A prevailing... So maybe they're more critical of the uh, the general populist response to Tarantino. It is, but and then there's a there's a smaller cadre that actually wants to dismiss him. And like him or not, you can't dismiss what he's doing. And I'm not even sure what he's doing. You know, that this conversation that he's having about violence in American culture, I think that one of the reasons he's rejected that reporter's question when he says, I'm not going to talk about violence in my films and how it affects people is because the film is exactly an answer to that question. The film is talking about our culture of violence and it's talking about the American culture and what formed that, what formed the way we think, how, you know, we're not so removed and from the Romans. <laughs> talking about the movies that it's paying tribute to. Exactly. And those movies, that's the conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I know a lot of filmmakers, too, who aren't very impressed with Tarantino. And I understand some of their complaints, you know. Uh, Sometimes to a filmmaker who really, really understands the history of all the films that Tarantino is pulling from, sometimes it feels like he's literally just grabbing screenshots from all his favorite movies and assembling them. But as a viewer sitting through it, I'm totally transported. So when you watch um, Django... Uh, well, I watched it. it was very close to Inglorious Bastards. I uh, felt like he was using a lot of the same, like he kind of 
mastered his craft in Inglorious Bastards and kind of just refining it now in yeah. Django. They're different movies. Totally. But also, they're both revenge stories and they're both revisionist history stories. Well, well but I mean, even more than that, I don't think that he thinks of... I, I feel like... This is total speculation on my part. I feel like he's merely thinking, how can I make someone who's totally badass and place them in one of the worst positions possible? A the, Jew in Europe during World War yeah. II, a black dude during 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 slavery. slavery. In America. You know, it's like um, uh, uh, there's a Doris Lessing wrote a great series of five uh, science fiction novels called Canopus and Argos Archives. They're totally seminal and really amazing. And in one of them. How do I put this? I want to tell the story quickly. Uh, it's about, it's a field reports on Earth and other planets within the universe by the benevolent race, the Canopians that oversee the universe. And so the first book called Shikasta is a field report on Earth from 30,000 years in the past until about 150 years in the future when the whole world holds the white men on trial for crimes against humanity. Okay. Um, but in, it, at the agents can move into lifetimes within the planets that they're monitoring. And one of the agents falls ill with the sickness of rhetoric. And in order to cure him, they send him to live a short, brutal life as a peasant during the French Revolution to teach him that <laughs> rhetoric means nothing. So, so I, I, I don't know where to go from that. I got nothing. <laughs> Let's go back to the characters, because you talked about earlier. You well, know, I, I guess what I think is, yeah. I, think of, I think that Tarantino is merely finding locations to put he's a character to practice driven. his he wants a character he loves he thinks Django. i want a badass i want to place him in the worst position possible i want to watch him triumph and, and, is, and once he creates those those initial parameters in his own head the gears just start winding and they the start winding and out. i don't even think he's thinking i'm going to engender a deep conversation about race but i think he thinks about it in a way that's novel and interesting and different than most people do and on a deeper level i think he i think he has said in the past that the that the post analysis of his scripts, where he sees the meta analysis, often happens long after he's shot the movie. Mm -hmm. And, and the, uh, there was an interview when for he, him for Inglorious Bastards, and one of the scenes where he touches on race is when they're at the bar and they're playing that card game. And when they're playing it, and you know, there's a joke that it's you know, is is he the story of uh, is the character playing the story of slavery in America? And it's no, it's King Kong. Yeah. And those things are so synonymous, but. It comes off as a joke, but in Tarantino's head, it's all one thing. Right. And that's that's him, again, using cinema as proving his point, having that conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also doing something really complicated in that scene in Inglorious Bastards. It's August Steele is the actor, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The one that plays the SS officer? Yes. yes. He makes you like him right there. But he looks so sinister. He's terrifying, yeah. but at that moment, he's so smart. You're like, what? Well, you like smart people. You like watching them figure he's, stuff he's out. He's the things that you like on in, in characters in film. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how, how, I mean, how does this apply to the other movies? Like if you look at Pulp Fiction, there's no meta narrative about, about, there's no truths about human nature or history. It's just, just, it's a, it's a, it's a, no, but I mean, so Tarantino said that he wanted violence to be, he wanted to make a film in which violence was one of the characters, right? So in Pulp Fiction, you have the super brutal opening scene and then mm -hmm. very little that's super difficult to watch happens until, uh, until, uh, uh, Butch. And 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 Ving, uh, sorry. Until uh, they until they get into uh, into, until Zed's in the, into Zed's basement. Into Zed's basement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a real like bad day. Forty five minutes or more than that of very little actual violence or action going on. But because of that opening sequence and the intensity of it, you are you you're still kind of on edge the whole time. And when that scene hits, it's almost like a relief, and it's the worst thing you could. Have. I remember thinking in the theater, "Is this going to be as bad as I think it's going to be?" Oh my god, it's so much worse than I thought. And it was then there's going a great be. moment of catharsis with, with the sword. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. totally. So I mean, I think the same themes are going on. He's building these characters that he loves, and he's putting them in these difficult positions, and he's looking at them slightly askance. I mean, Pulp Fiction is almost. Again, he described it as taking a lot of the tropes of the gangster film and turning it on its head. Like, oh, you see the hitman kill somebody, but then you spend the rest of the day with them. Yeah. yeah. Like, how does this affect the rest of their afternoon? After the fighter throws the I, fight, I think how does he get away? It, he is much more interested in setting. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was movies have different settings and how the settings inform his characters and their behavior. 
it's it's almost like a kid with an anthill the way he plays with characters right he takes the characters he finds them he makes them and then takes the magnifying glass in the anthill and sees what happens right you know what happens if you burn this right, guy and right. and so on and, and so a, forth a great down the line exercise in world building in all his movies there are little backstories that you get hints at but you never and in Django especially there's the one character i think she's labeled as tracker Zoe Bell's character yeah. and she's there for just several scenes and she has that red scarf over her mouth she's then, the the like the field hand like the hand the, at, the, a part at of the trackers, Candy's farm the, the trackers group okay um and then she's killed but right before she's killed she's looking at some photographs right. of, of like Athens or something and you have some hint of a story and i think in an interview they said that originally in Quentin Tarantino's mind uh the scarf would reveal a woman with no jaw Oh wow! Yeah, wow. Yeah, you, I assume that there's something horrible with her face. I, yeah. I, I like, why would she be with scarred. these other horrible people? Um, but these characters have stories. <laughs> well, she was notable because she was a woman. She's yeah, looking yeah, at the stereogram, yeah, yeah, yeah. so she's thinking yeah. about something beyond what the other buffoons yeah. are thinking about. Uh, Jenko also, it's almost it's. I think it's his first origin story because if you go to a movie like Kill Bill. Uma Thurman has that whole history. Right. Uh, the, the, the Viper Assassination Quad has that history. In Inglorious Bastards, well, uh, Brad Pitt has a history. Right. You have, you know, the scar. Only, only he and uh, Tarantino know why that scar why is Why that scar neck. is there. I, yeah. I think the, the popular belief is that he was hanged by the Klan. Oh. Because he was fighting against the Klan in the South. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. So there's, well, a, pretty, and, there's and, a tie together. Is what and you're Django saying. Unchained, I mean, Django's wife's. Last name. Last name is, is Von, Von Schaft. Schaft. So clearly she is the great, 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 great Absolutely. grandmother of, of Schaft. Of John yeah. Schaft, which is confirmed at Comic-Con. Uh, but yeah, but Chango, <laughs> he goes, he, he starts off the story with nothing. And it's not like he knew he was going to be the fastest gun in the South, but he was taught by Christoph Waltz. Mm -hmm. And so it's his whole... It is like a superhero origin story because he gets a costume at the end. He's wearing Candy's suit at the very end. Yes, and and he you know changes different suits throughout the the movie, and you could see at the end that's the beginning of their story. So this is this is another criticism that's often leveled at him, and you know people can obviously have their their critique of the films, but one of the things is I know. I, I had a couple of friends who were Jewish who f were very upset at the end of Inglorious Bastards because they thought it was, they they thought someone who wasn't Jewish was deciding to make like the ultimate Jewish fantasy of killing Hitler in a movie, uh, and I've heard the same the same uh, criticism leveled at and the criticism is oh Tarantino is saying that if only the Jews were more badass they could have won World War II. He's that's saying if only black people were more badass all. they could have and yeah. again yeah no that's not I don't think that that's what's being said whatsoever. And, and the producer of Django was Reginald Hudlin, the creator of the BET network and I mean so but, many people were involved. There's I don't think that I don't think that there's any traction in in somehow calling Tarantino a racist of of any stripe. Uh, I don't think there's any traction there whatsoever. Um, I think that the the questions that he brings up, I'm not even sure he's consciously bringing them up as he's writing the scenes and building the characters. I think as he's putting those together, f things are crystallizing for him. Um, and, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to watching this film in a year and seeing how I feel about it, watching the extra materials, looking at some uncut scenes. I always learn so much about his process, looking at the scenes he cuts out. In fact, now whenever I watch Pulp Fiction, I have in my memory mm -hmm. the whole conversation that Vince and Mia have about being an Elvis dude versus being a Beatles dude. And yeah, that's and, all and I, I'm disappointed it's not in the movie. But it is. It's in my head. Well, well, fair enough. And and it's there It's it's there in the sophistication of the, his realization that all she has to say is an Elvis dude like yourself. And bang, she you know that whole conversation conversation has happened oh that's uh, absolutely uh, but the thing the thing about his movies for me is that they stand up to repeated viewing more than anybody else of this of this era like, well and the first one that taught me that is jackie brown he says he says in the dvd of jackie brown he said i wanted to make a movie with characters you wanted to hang out with or yeah. dell and jackie and robert for and max i mean they're not good people but then you sit down and watch that movie yeah. like that movie gets better Every time I watch it, I enjoy it more, and I think it's yeah. funnier and weirder. Even Reservoir Dogs, which was which was is proto Tarantino at this point. So, you know? yeah. it's so raw and it's long in weird places, and it's too short in others. Watching and... Tim Roth die oh. is so exhausting at the end. You just at the end, you're just like fucking die already. Okay, <laughs> Do you know my my wife has a theory about 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 uh, Reservoir Dogs. Oh, let's hear it. She thinks that it's Romeo and Juliet. And that Harvey Keitel and Tim Roth are the Montagues and the Capulets. I can kind of see that. I mean, it kind of works. I think works. it totally grids right on top. 
Oh, it's been so long since I read <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. But... Well, and then the, dr- the the scene in the Miami airport with the with the with, where, with the drug dog yeah. is um is the po- going to the apothecary. Right, right. Oh, and, well, um, I mean, uh, you know, he actually said that he thought that uh, 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 Melanie Laurent and the guy that played the uh, Captain Zoller mm-hmm. uh, in Inglorious Bastards, he thought of them as Romeo and Juliet. Except that, they hate each other. Yes, he said, but under many other circumstances, if you put them into different parts of history, they'd fall for each other. Two sides of the same coin, right? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Um, uh, we got to talk about Samuel L. Jackson in Django. And which that is character, really, the really, character, yes. Right? Very and, difficult yes. portrayal. There's, there's a lot of different, I mean, there's a, as I, I'm not an actor, never been an actor. I got to think that as you're reading the script, some of you, some part of you is thinking, Wow, is this going to be the last thing I ever do? Is this it? No, but it's Sam Jackson and... Uh, uh, no, I understand. I and mean, he and Tarantino sort of came up together with his performance in Pulp Fiction. And Tarantino Absolutely. said that he, he and... Uh, I know it seems like I have a million Tarantino quotes in my head, but it's, I do really do read like thousands of interviews. Um, he said that uh, Sam Jackson and, and, and uh, uh, Christoph Waltz are the two greatest interpreters of, of his, his work of his dialogue he has a there's a poetry there's a a cadence to the way he writes yeah. and he needs an actor to make their own but not take away from the writing the thing that i found most impressive about jackson's performance is and there are few actors who really exploit this and i i think of them i tend to think of them as beat actors because they're really working on a on a beat by beat by beat, they're doing different things and they're making choices so that there's a real rhythm both to what they're saying and what their face is doing. And what Sam Jackson's character, Stephen, does that's most interesting is watching his face when he's not being watched by white people in the movie, watching the serious and the gra- the seriousness and the gravity come over his face when you realize how smart, mm-hmm. how conniving, and how the brilliant The best scene he is. is when he calls Candy into the study and he's sitting there in the nice chair with the wine, and he talks in a straight Sam Jackson voice, yeah. and there is none of that the, the caricature. It's, it's very impressive. It's it. The, I was gonna say that, and the and when he's when he's watching um uh, Broom, uh Broomhilda, mm-hmm. when he's watching her, yeah, the sneering. and he's figuring it out. Yeah, it is it is a it is a awful it's, awful but face. Then he also has the, one of the best comedic beats when Candy dies, and he's the first one who screams no. Yeah. Well, and, I, I thought the funny the funnier part of that scene was when he's kind of in the line of fire, but not exactly, and he just kind of real like the scene's dead still. Everybody's super intense. Right, right, and he back triggers back a and he's just backing up ever so slowly. That made like a me laugh. I am I. Was I was the only shocked. person in the theater laughing at that one. I was shocked when 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 Dr. King Schultz shoots Candy. I was totally shocked when I read it in the script, just as shocked when I saw it in the movie. I cannot believe that he does that. He yeah. is such a, he's such, got such a pathology of like, I want my elaborate plan to yeah. come to, and I don't want anyone to be directing this scene but me. And when Candy's about to get one up, he just shoots him in the chest. <laughs> he couldn't, couldn't help himself. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> um, so Roger Ebert had a really good theory about the Schultz character and that he is, he's kind of like a magician in that world. He's deus ex machina because he kind of wanders in you know, the movie starts off, and it's a great description of the uh, the chain of slaves yes. walking because they're like a human loco- locomotive. Yeah. When they're breathing, it's like the, the steam. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Schultz finds them in the middle of, of Texas. Magically. 30 miles from anything. A guy riding a yeah. stagecoach, which right. the stagecoach is an interesting story because it's only yeah. there because he couldn't ride the horse. He's yeah. injured. Uh, that's the origin of that tooth. But it's very, it's very much, you know, Cinderella and with the stagecoach. And as Schultz seemingly is infallible with his plans, he has his pocketbook with unlimited money. He tells Django, kill this guy, kill that guy. And then he only dies because he chooses to at the very end. So he's Merlin. He, he, he is Merlin in that movie. <laughs> the, the, the tooth, the tooth was the biggest laugh of the movie for me. The tooth bouncing back When, and when forth. you see in the first shot and it's super still, and then the second shot it's twanging back and forth like crazy. <laughs> it was so out of place and so bizarre. I, and I just, I just, I just guffawed. Um, you should go see Django. Is Django is, yes, it is worth seeing. It's important. It's really difficult to watch in many places. It is concerning and confusing. And I, I, I think it's, I think we're better that it exists. But I'm, I'm so glad that Jamie Foxx, who I was skeptical of the role, because originally it was Will Smith. You know, Will Smith. And then they went through Idris Elba was supposed to do it. Uh, even Omar from The Wire. The guy yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it. I'm a big, big fan um, of Idris. And 
you got Jamie Foxx, a guy who's done good work, you know, Ray Collateral. I'm a big fan of Jamie Foxx, and I have been for a long time. I, you know, and one of the things is like I've, I'm one of the few people that didn't love Ray. Mm-hmm. I felt like it was almost a little too much of too. He wasn't exactly a me. nice man by but, all reports. But uh, I really liked Foxx's stand up comedy, and I, knowing that he's a that he's a really proficient and 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 excellent stand up comic made me made. Most of my favorite actors have have some of that as a background, mm. and Fox knowing that, knowing how to listen to an audience, knowing really the sound of his voice. Now, cutting aside his weird non finished sentences from the uh, Golden Globes last night. Oh, I didn't see he that. Spoke, oh, he, I didn't, I didn't, oh, I missed him. Yeah, he he uh, he introduced Django Unchained for Best Picture, uh, and managed to speak in. Almost none, no, none of his sentences had beginnings, middles, and ends. So the Jody Foster method. It was yeah, it was very strange. Wow. I think the teleprompter might have been bro- like it seemed it, like the teleprompter broke yeah. like three times. But I'm I'm a big fan of Fox, and I have been for a long time. I I think that, he really uh, owns the role. Absolutely, yeah. and yeah. he's got a tremendous amount of charisma. Uh, the music in this movie is also tremendous. Yeah. The oh. second time, notice it's so good. The songs he chooses for well, everything. And it was, there was a score too, right? There, there's a score. There's like a spaghetti yeah. western yeah, kind yeah. of score yeah. in the background, mm-hmm. in addition yeah. to the to the specific music. Did Robert scenes. Rodriguez have something to do with I the score? No, so. I don't think so. No, he did no. the Kill Bill score. Did he? Yeah. Um, yeah. Huh. The first one or the second one? Or both? Uh, I think it was both. A, really? Both. Okay. Yeah. From what I understand, that he asked Tarantino if he could score it. And Tarantino said, like, I guess so. Sure. And he's like, Look, I'll score it. And if you don't like it, you don't use it. And he ended up using it. <laughs> Very interesting. It's a weird little incestuous business. I know. It? I yeah. know. Tarantino, he's a director of anecdotes. anecdotes, full of anecdotes. So many stories. Totally. Every interview. I would I, I I would love to meet him someday and and talk for about twenty hours. So I went and watched Blazing Saddles after I saw Django. <laughs> no way, really? I really did. <laughs> we were, that was your unicorn chase. We were we were at home. We were like <laughs> playing board games. I was like, "You want to watch Blazing Saddles?" She was like, "I never want to watch Blazing Saddles, but yeah, I'll watch Blazing Saddles." Wow. It is a it is a it was a hard turn. I mean, <laughs> it's not not recommended. Not a good idea. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll see you guys next week. All um, right. Uh, housekeeping. Thanks for posting reviews on iTunes. We really appreciate we it. We totally ton. appreciate it. Um, even if you don't like us, reviews no, are awesome. No, we love the yeah. feedback. Yeah. Um, uh, you can find this is only a test on the other feed on tested.com slash podcast. Uh, and I guess that's it. Uh, so we'll see you guys uh, next week. Thanks very much. Bye.